Lord God, you are a great God. And Scripture tells us that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Well, that first Word was Jesus. And we love Jesus, and wanna, we hope that everything we have done today blesses and praises that word today. But Father, I pray that you will also show us how his story is our story. And I pray this, that the Holy Spirit will actually come and speak to every heart. Just bypass me. Go directly to every heart. In Jesus' name, amen. We have a the slide here. There it is. If maybe see if my I'm gonna actually use the use this. I'm gonna stand for if you're gonna believe it. I love story. I'm a storyteller. Those of you who know me know I love story. I love to tell stories. I love to write stories. I love to watch stories. Uh, I wake up every single morning. I know this makes me sound a little weird. At 4:30 in the morning so that I can write stories. And also because my dog makes me get up. But I love stories, and I believe that every great mythic story that we tell and love is an echo of the great story. And there's a reason why we love it. So my thing is just is not working. I don't, uh, apparently I've done it wrong here. Let's try it now. There, I think maybe it's working or you just hit it. I believe, by the way, with all my heart, that God speaks to us through everything. He speaks through nature. He speaks to us through other people. Obviously, he speaks through, uh, to us through his word. God is such a powerful God that he can speak to us through anything. And sometimes that even means the books that we read, the films that we watch. Psalms 50 says, the mighty one. Oh, no. The mighty one, God, the Lord, speaks to us through all things on earth. And that's, I italicize that, through all things on earth, from the rising of the sun to the place where it sets. I believe God speaks to us through all things. Now, some people don't always like to talk about story because story sounds like fiction. Some of you grew up in, in, in a home that maybe do, didn't like fiction. I remember hearing that a lot, that that we shouldn't, as Christians, speak of fairy tales, for example, folk tales, fictional tales. And I, I'm just going to put my bias out there. I'm an English teacher, so I like stories. And again, I do believe that God speaks to us through everything. And there are two great Christian apologists from the 20th century. I would say the greatest Christian apologist of the 20th century, C.S. Lewis, and C.S. Lewis's favorite writer, G.K. Chesterton. And G.K. Chesterton, also a great apologist who would write story, he wrote, fairy tales do not tell children the dragons exist. Children already know that dragons exist. But fairy tales tell children the dragons can be killed. So I think there actually is value in some of the stories that we tell. Now, I, have, I want you to do something right now. This is going to be a little uh, participation here. I want you right now to think of your favorite stories in the world. Okay? So think about it. Maybe it's your favorite movie. You've seen it 50 times. You'll probably see it 50 times more. You have no idea why you love this, but you just do. And not the stories that you're supposed to like. You just happen to love it. Maybe it's your guilty pleasure. Or perhaps or perhaps it's your favorite book. I have people coming up here. They're like about to take me off the stage here or something. Or maybe, you, maybe you're one of the people left in the world who reads books. How many of you read books still? All right. 10% of the population reads 60% of the books. The average college graduate 
will, after graduation, read on average three and a half books. So if you're reading books, you're doing a wonderful thing for your brain. What's your favorite book? What's your favorite movie? All right, right now, I know you've got one in your mind. I'm going to ask you to do something scary. Tell your neighbor. Tell your neighbor your favorite story, your favorite movie, favorite book, maybe the book you've read several times. All right. Now, real quick, we're a friendly church. I want you to yell out some of the stories you heard somebody else say. Ready? Go. Walk to remember. Ever after. Harry Potter. Pride and Prejudice. Uh, any uh, Lord of the Rings fans? Narnia fans? Oh, we got a few. How about this one? What is your favorite Bible story? Do you have a favorite Bible story? Real quick, take 20 seconds. Think of it. But then tell your neighbor your favorite Bible story. Maybe this is the one when you were a kid, you would go to this one for charades. All right, everybody, tell me one of the Bible stories you heard somebody else say. Ready, go. Damn it, Job, Daniel, David, Joseph. Gideon, Jonah, these are all good stories. I love these stories. Now, here's something to, to ask yourself. What do these stories have in common? Do you notice that the stories that you love have something in common? Maybe they're, maybe you love romances. Maybe you love stories about restoration, where, where somebody actually is restored back to the community. Or maybe where you have misunderstood characters who somehow are proven worthy. There's more to them than they realize. Or maybe you just love the epic good versus evil story, like most summer blockbuster films, right? Notice that they have something in common and ask yourself this question. Why? Why? Now, the answer to that question probably says more about you and who you are and who God made you to be, I actually believe. Now, here's something that's kind of interesting. This is my favorite movies. Okay, you're not allowed to laugh. No laughing. Okay, these are actually my top five. Okay, not taken from my top 100. These are my top five. Number one, I love Am Amadeus. I love this film. Anyone seen this movie? It's a beautiful film. Completely false about the story of how somebody murdered Mozart. I love it. Um, the music is spectacular. I love this one right here, The Passion of the Christ. I know not everyone loves this story. I not, I not Well, you may love the story, but you don't love this film. It's violence. It's horrific. I actually think the film is genius, absolute genius. Okay, I love this one, Ben-Hur. Anyone love Ben-Hur? Not the new one. I like the one with Charlton Heston in it. How do you like, how about, you can't help but love a story that's, that is a story that really revolves in, around the story of Jesus, but also has a really good chariot race in it. You got to love that. And then, I love this one, The Sound of Music. I do love that one. How many of you love The Sound of Music? Raise your hand. Raise it high, raise it high, because it's important for everyone else to see who's going to heaven. I love Sound of Music. And then somebody told me I have to turn in my man card for this next one. But my other favorite is Pride and Prejudice. That sounded like all the women. And uh, I love Pride and Prejudice. I love any story where there's some kissing at the end and they don't kill the dog. That's especially that you don't kill the dog. But I do love Pride and Prejudice. Uh, a lot of you may not realize this, but uh, I have a graduate degree with an emphasis in women's studies, which has not helped me to understand women at all. <laughs> but it has absolutely made me appreciate Jane Austen, Charlotte Bronte, 
Virginia Woolf, some of these wonderful authors. And then my favorite Bible stories, without a doubt, would be, first of all, I love the story of Gideon. I think it's probably because when I was a kid, my two sisters and I tried to figure out what to do with on Sabbath because my, si my parents, for some reason, wanted to take a nap on Sabbath afternoon. It made no sense to us. It makes perfect sense to us now. So we would play charades. And I, they would be the Midianites. I'd be Gideon. I'd blow my trumpet. They'd fall over dead. It was awesome. And then, and then I also loved Jericho, the same reason. They would, I'd march around them, you know, seven times. It was great. And then for some reason, I've always been enamored with the story of Miriam. I think it's probably because I love playing the tambourine. Uh, but I, her story arc is rather fascinating where she's a key part of Moses' team and at the same time runs up against uh, God's judgment for being a racist. Read about that. So anyway, so what? What about these stories? Where am I going with this on a Sabbath sermon? I'm actually going somewhere very serious. Now, a lot of people have noticed for a long time that the great mythic stories that we tell are the same stories. And I'm going to use that term myth quite a bit here in the next few minutes. When I say myth, I don't mean it in the way it means in contemporary society as a lie. Like if you say that's a myth, that's a fib. No, I mean it in the sense of mythos. It means story. And it doesn't just mean story. It doesn't mean just any random story. It means the epic, mythic stories that are so central to our culture that we can't separate the story from the culture or the culture from the story. They're that important together. And that story seems to be the same story. Now, that doesn't mean that it's not true. I would argue that in Christianity, our central story, our central myth, is the death and resurrection of Jesus. It is the most important story we have to tell. You take away the death and resurrection of Christ, not only does Christianity crumble, but much of world history crumbles. That is such a, an important story. You take that story away, and my life crumbles. I believe it is true with all of my heart. But in that sense, it is a myth. Okay, you can have family myths that are central. I'll give you a good example. When I was 12 years old, we had a Thanksgiving. And my mom prepared this beautiful Thanksgiving feast with a paper tablecloth. And I don't know why, but they, they put the turkeys on the tablecloth. So I guess you can see what it looked like before you killed it. And then, uh, I know, sad, isn't it? And... Uh, my sister, who is uh, two years younger than me, thought it would be fun because my mom would take little tea lights, little tea candles, and put one in front of every single place setting and then light the candle. And my sister thought it would be fun to tear off a piece of the tablecloth and light it on fire. But it was okay because she had a big goblet of water right there. So she tore off a piece of the paper and set it on fire. I don't know what this tablecloth was made of, but it just took flame. <laughs> so my sister put it in her water goblet that was empty. And so then she panicked. She dropped it on the table. The whole table took, on, took off on fire. My dad went and got the extinguisher, sprayed it over our Thanksgiving dinner, and ruined much of our Thanksgiving dinner, and we've let yet to let her forget it. We tell this story over and over and over again. It's not our central myth, but it's an important story to our family. And here's an important point to remember. You can tell if a myth is a living myth or a dead myth by one simple way. Does it have ritual attached? All living myths, all living stories ritual attached to it. And a ritual is not the same thing as a habit. It's not the same thing as a tradition. It is a reenactment of the myth. 
So, for example, if the death and resurrection of Jesus is our most important story, our most important myth, is it a living myth or is it a dead myth? It's a living myth, not only because that is the only way by which we are saved, but we can also tell because it has ritual attached to it. We actually have a service in which we act that out. Anyone know what it is? Communion. That's right. When we take the bread, when we take the cup, we're taking on the blood and the body of Christ. It's even more extraordinary than that because when Jesus took the bread, he was doing it on the night that they were celebrating the most important myth, the most important story for Judaism, the Passover. And this was the ritual attached to it. And Jesus said from this point on, the Passover is no longer going to be your most important story. My death and resurrection is now going to be your most important story. And from now on, when you take this bread, you'll do it remembering me. When you take this cup, you're not going to think of the Passover. You're going to think of my blood shed for you. It's genius. I don't know about you, but I don't know if it's ever dawned on you. Not only is Jesus our God, he's also the smartest guy that ever lived. To this day, my family still gets together on holidays. And uh, my mom's still are with us, and she still puts out a beautiful spread, and she still puts out little tea lights, lights the candles. And she lights every candle except for the one in front of my sister. <laughs> my sister is 51 years old, and she is no threat to starting the table on fire but it's a ritual reenacting a story that's important to us. Now, Carl Jung, who is one of the original founders, if you will, of behavioral science, of psychoanalysis, the protege of Freud, uh, he began to notice that the mythic stories that we really love, we can't help but keep going back to over and over and over again, that they all seem to be telling one story. As a matter of fact, he called it the dream of humanity, that perhaps somehow we all have one, have a dream that we've all dreamed as a mass. Well, he's close. He was very interested in the fact that this one story seems an awful lot like the human story, and that perhaps if he could learn this story, he could help people in their process of getting better. He was definitely on to something. Now, his last protege was a man by the name of Joseph Campbell. And Joseph Campbell put out a book in 1949 called The Hero with a Thousand Faces, where he actually took this idea that the mythic stories that we love, the one story, the one story that is every single great story we love, including every great story in the Bible, and he actually maps it out. If it's one story, then we should be able to map it out. And he does. And he called it the hero's journey. And it's, 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 it's a simple story, really. You see it every single time you watch a film you really love, read a book you really love, or, or read the story of Joseph or David or Moses. So you have a hero. And the hero has a call to adventure. Something will call that hero to adventure. There will be a refusal a, to, to the adventure. He doesn't want to go on it. She doesn't want to go on the adventure. But the hero is going to meet up with a mentor, some sort of an aid, a supernatural aid oftentimes. So, for example, if you're a Lord of the Rings fan, you might have a Frodo who has a Gandalf. If you are a fan of Star Wars, you could have a Luke Skywalker who has an Obi-Wan Kenobi. You might be a Hallmark Christmas movie lover, and you'll notice that the hero always has a buddy. Have you noticed that? Always has a buddy. Now, and I'm not saying, by the way, Hallmark Christmas movies are our great mythic stories. Please do not quote me on that. And then there will be a point where the hero will cross the threshold. There will be a point where the hero in the adventure will go past the point of no return. Now, 
once that happens, then there will be additional tests, things for the hero to go up against. And the hero will pick up more friends, more allies. Maybe uh, Han Solo and Chewbacca. I know this is probably the first ad where you're talking about Han Solo and Chewbacca. And maybe pick up some mice, like as in Cinderella. You're going to pick up more friends. There's going to be a point where the hero is going to go into some sort of absolute despair, where they... It, where Campbell actually calls it the belly of the whale. Sometimes he also calls it the pit of despair. Now, from this, the, the hero will eventually come out, face more tests, but will finally have to face the final test or final challenge alone, always alone. Simba will have to face Scar alone. Um... At one point, Cinderella is going to actually have to face her stepmother alone. It's always going to happen. Even at some point, Joseph is going to have to face his brothers alone. And then from there, then the hero will come back to the world that he was at before, that she was at before, to bring something that he or she has learned or gained, and the world is better. That's every mythic story that we love. And you can map it. So much so, George Lucas, when he wrote Star Wars, actually had Joseph Campbell's book at his desk, and he wrote it paint by number. That's not a criticism of him, by the way. That's a praise. That actually shows he understood we know one story, so you may as well figure out how am I going to use that one story. The what I think is one of the best screenplay writers, Linda Wolverton. She wrote stories like Disney's, oh, I don't know, Beauty and the Beast, Lion King, Mulan, Pocahontas. She also did the live action Alice in Wonderland. You know, a few things like that. She wrote all of those paint by number using the one story because it's the only story we love. Now, if we only love one story, and I know you're already now beginning to think of every story you love, and is it the same story? Yes, it is. And if it's not, it's probably not a story that you will keep returning to. There are lots of other stories, but they, we don't keep returning to them. We don't love them, and others don't love them the way we love this one story. Now, Joseph Campbell, in arguing this, was asked very shortly before he died, the question, why? Why do we only tell one story? And he gives the worst answer. Here's what he says. He says, we find ourselves in every culture, in every era, from Gilgamesh to Star Wars, telling the same story over and over again. The question I am asked most often is, why? My simple but unsatisfying answer is, just because. I hate that answer just because. That's like my mom. Mom, why do we have to do that? Because. Right? Because I said so. I don't like that answer a lot. So I turn to what I think is actually a far greater thinker than Joseph Campbell, greater thinker than Carl Jung, my favorite author of the 20th century, C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis also argued for this same sort of one story because he and his friend J.R.R. Tolkien noticed it even before Campbell did. And they called it the great story. They noticed that we have one story. As a matter of fact, it's part of how C.S. Lewis was converted to Christianity. C.S. Lewis was an atheist. And J.R.R. Tolkien tried very hard to convert him to Christianity. And over and over again, C.S. Lewis said he didn't believe, but one day when Tolkien and Lewis were on a bus going to the zoo, Lewis said, I can't believe in a God because there's so much wrong with the world. And Tolkien said, where did you get the idea that there's anything wrong with the world? Where did that come from? Lewis said, I got on the bus an, ath an atheist, and I got off the bus a Christian. And suddenly it made sense. And suddenly 
the two of them begin to explore how story, how story affects us and how we just tell one story. But here's what, here's what C.S. Lewis said in one of my favorite books of his, The Weight of Glory. I recommend it. It's a hard book, but it's a, such a powerful Christian statement about what it is to be a scholar. And he says the value of the myths or the great stories we most enjoy is they reveal all the things we know about ourselves and restore those things which have been hidden by a veil of the familiar. All right, that's just a very fancy schmancy way of saying we love these stories because they feel familiar to us. There's something that resonates. We recognize it. Later, Lewis will say, because it's the story we're in. But Lewis will take it a step further. Not only do we love it because it's the story we're in, we love it because of this point of the story. Every single one of the stories that we're drawn to, these great mythic stories, the one story, the only story we like, has one point, and that is that you are more than you think you are. We respond to that because we're in this story, and isn't that the gospel? that we are more than we realize. God, the God of the universe, is setting out to help us discover that who we are, we are his children. We're his children. First Peter 4 tells us that we are all priests. Revelation 10 says we are kings and queens. And Romans, of course, says it best, perhaps, that we are priests and we are kings and we are all joint heirs with Jesus. We are actually princes and princesses in the royal family of God. We are more than we realize it, and yet we go about like we're beggars. There's a pivotal moment in one of the great American myths, if you will, one of the stories, and people often wonder what makes these stories resonate. How many of you have seen The Lion King? Admit it. Okay, that's quite a few. In the animated film, there's an interesting moment. You have Simba. He's gone through the, the, the hero's journey, and he's even picked up a few buddies. He just happens to be a pig and a meerkat. And, but he has an interesting mystical moment where he looks up in the sky, and he has a vision of his father, who's Mufasa. And Mufasa has that great James Earl Jones voice. I wish I had a voice like that. Where it, I always feel like that sounds like what I imagine God to sound like, you know. You know, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You know, it's, well, yeah. Um, but then I don't like it because then I always hear like, <laughs> but Mufasa speaks to his son. Does anyone remember what he says? He says, remember who you are. You are more than you have become. I remember, I remember seeing this because I'm old. When it first came out, there was an audible gasp in the audience. Why? Because not only was this telling the one story, the only story we love, but it was telling the one point that is in that story, that we are more than we have become. And that there's a plan for and then, of course, Simba will go out and meet Scar and ultimately have to face him alone. Czeslaw Miloš, one of my favorite poets, won the Nobel Prize. I got to shake his hand when he was 100. I um, haven't, haven't washed it since. And uh, I'm kidding. And he says, uh, he says, we tell one story and only one because there is a sense that we are more than we are. That's why C.S. Lewis argued that the reason we love this story is that they are echoes of the great story. We as Adventists should recognize that story. It's called the great controversy. You know, you think about it, Adventists are actually better equipped to speak to a postmodern audience than about any other group. Because postmodern world has given up on doctrinal precepts. The postmodern world has given up on these and thous, but you know what they haven't given up on? 
story. They still love story. Why am I a Seventh-day Adventist, people often ask me. I can tell you why. There are many reasons, but one of the best reasons is that our, our salvational story, our, our salvational process is a story. And we're not even the main character. We're actually a side character. It's Jesus is the main character. Exonerating the character of God. John Eldridge says in his book, Epic, and I love John Eldridge, uh, we keep telling the same story because that's the story we're in. So the point I'm making is that the reason why we love it is we're in that story and God made you to be more than you are. That's why we crave stories about people who rise to the occasion. That's why we crave people who are royalty and don't know it. That's why we love stories about people who have bold and unrealized dreams or who are oppressed and then victorious because that's the story we're called to be in right now. You are called to be in that story right now. God has given you the gifts to be in that story right now. And we walk around like beggars. Now, I love this, this quote here. It's such an important one to me that says, I have such plans for you, God says. To, plans for you to do great things. I don't want you to be hurt as you are. I have plans to give you hope and a future. The day is coming when you will call upon me, you will pray to me, and I will listen to you. And when you seek me with all your heart, you will find me. I believe that. Because that's part of our story. Part of our story is seeking him and finding him. But have you ever wondered why our story stinks sometimes? It's because notice how the great story, the epic story, the hero's journey, the great controversy has a villain in it. All of the stories have a villain in it because our story has a villain in it. And we love to blame God, but we forget that our story has a villain in it. Here's some of my favorite villains, actually, in film. Some of them, the one that's frightened me the most is the one there in the bottom from Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. How many of you remember the kid catcher from Chitty Chitty Bang Bang? I'm just going to say right now, I can't believe my parents let me watch that. Yes. <laughs> so. So we have an enemy. We have a villain in our story. We have, we, we need to not forget that. As, as Paul says, this is no afternoon athletic contest that we'll walk away from and forget about in a couple of hours. This is for keeps. A life or death fight to the finish against the devil and all his angels. So be prepared. And take up, oh, you, you almost want to sing a song from the Lion King there, don't you? Be prepared. You're up against far more than you can handle on your own. Take all the help you can get, every weapon God has issued, so that when it's all over but the shouting, you'll still be on your feet. And don't forget to pray. You know what this is? This is, this is a wonderful exhortation to a hero that's about to go on a journey, that's about to go on an adventure. It's a great exhortation to us. Because we are more than we think we are. So, more than we think we are. God has a purpose for your life. And you may not always feel it, but believe it or not, those of you who are college kids, oh, not kids, I'm so sorry, that was like an unpardonable sin. College students, I'm old, sorry. You have such a life ahead of you. God has a plan for your life, you are more than your parents even realize. You are more than your roommate realizes. You are more than your teachers realize. And those of us who are older, I really don't dislike right now that our culture seems to discard the value of our older people. You know what? Notice in the Bible when many of the great heroes of the Bible are called into action, they're old. Moses, he's about 80 years old. Abraham, Sarah, they're getting up there. 
Yeah, Daniel. Daniel is an old man when he's in the lion's den. You're not done yet. God's not done with you yet. If you feel like you're done, that means God's about to do something big with you. We are called to an adventure. We are called to a story. And it's a beautiful story. And notice the best part of the story is we know who wins in the end. We know who wins in the end. Now, in the hero's journey, it, it doesn't mean that there aren't hardships or are plenty, and it also doesn't mean that the hero won't die. But it does mean that the world will be better because of the hero. So I'm not telling you you're going to end and there will be people cheering for you. You might actually get to the end and no one even realizes what you've done. And yet the world will be better because you followed the call of God. We have a story. It's a beautiful story. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much that you, you've made us creatures that love story. And clearly the reason we love story is because we live story. And you are a God of story. And Lord, I pray that, that we will answer your call to adventure. We feel the urge to pull away, and yet you are our supernatural helper who is with us along the way. You are the one who helps us in a series of battles along the way. You are the one that helps us even when we're in the pit of despair, when we're in the belly of the whale, and you're the one who will stand with us even when everyone else sees us standing alone. And you are the one who has called us to a purpose to actually bring a gift to the world, and that gift is Jesus. Give us the courage to be the hero that you would have us be. And I believe that that pertains to churches as well. Lord, I pray that our church will have the courage to answer your call, and to take on the adventure, and to go about a series of tests you've called us on and ultimately to accomplish what it is that you have planned for us. Thank you, Lord. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.